sing about the greatness of God. And boy, that verse that talks about when God, his son not sparing, sent him to die. Boy, how scarce I can. Whew, boy, that's good. That's good stuff this morning. You can say amen. It's okay. All right, there you go. All right, both of you, thank you. So, no, I'm just kidding. It's okay to get excited about being saved. It's okay to, to smile about thinking about Jesus and His greatness, about God and His greatness. And it's okay uh, to just take a moment and say, thank you, Lord. It's okay to, to raise your hand when you're singing. And uh, the Bible talks about the raising of holy hands. And it's okay to do that and, and, and praise to Him. We don't do it to, to put on a show or to, or to mock or make fun or to be silly or go crazy. But it's okay once in a while when you're, when you're singing praises to the Lord and when you're praying and, and, and to lift up the hand of the Lord and just say, Lord, thank you. It's okay just to say amen. It's okay just to say praise the Lord. It's okay to do that and uh, it's all right. So this morning we're going to continue looking in the book of John. John chapter number 18 this morning. John chapter number 18. We're going through and looking at the book of John. And we've talked again and again about the purpose of the book of John. And if you've not been here for a little while, or maybe you've missed a couple of weeks or something, i just kind of catch you back up on where we've at. And for, for quite some time, we've been looking at here in this passage uh, of John over the last several chapters, we have been looking at Jesus. Thank you, sir. We have been looking at Jesus and uh, His disciples and their time in the upper room together. And Jesus went through and there were many a thing that He taught them as they were there in the upper room. They were partaking of the Passover dinner and He's there with them and eating with them. He's talking to them. He has taken um, uh, and wiped their feet and washed their feet and taught them about being a servant. He's taught them about what true leadership is and what it is to desire to follow the Lord, what it is to uh, walk with Him and to abide in Him. He talked about that in John chapter 15. He talked about being the, the vine and, and, and His disciples and His followers being the branches and how important it is to abide in Him. He's talked to them about the, the Holy Spirit, the comforter that's going to come into the world. He's talked to them about sending Him. He's talked to them about the Father and He's talked to them about uh, things to come. He's talked to them about His death. He's talked about how He's going away. He's talked to them about the traitor, Judas. He talked to Peter about denying Him. Boy, there's been so much that has been fit in here in just a few, uh, a few short hours. I can never say a few short hours. I don't know why I, I can't say that. I always mess that up. But in just a few short hours, there has been so many uh, things that Christ has talked to His disciples about. And then we saw Him begin to go and to walk and leave. Last week we saw Him taking His disciples and, and praying for His disciples. As they had left the upper room and were on their way to the garden, Jesus prays. In John chapter 17, we saw the great prayer that Jesus prays for His disciples that are there with Him. Oh, but the good news that Jesus prayed for you and for me as well. He said, for all those that will come to a faith in me also. That's what He talked about there. And uh, we thank the Lord for His prayer for us. I want you to look at John chapter number 18 this morning. So I want you to, to follow through the scenario with where we are and with what's been going on. Jesus has been giving all of this information to His disciples. He's been pouring into them all that is about to happen and all that is going to take place. He is walking. It's nighttime. And He is walking with them now outside and they're walking towards the Garden of Gethsemane. They have all kind of thoughts in their mind about what's going on and about what's getting ready to happen and what's going to take place. As they get there, picture in your mind's eye that they've been walking along, having these conversations, talking about various different things. And I want you to uh, put yourself there in the garden. It's dark. It's night. They're somewhat worried and somewhat concerned because of all the things. They are sorrowful. Remember Jesus had told them about, uh, He said, your sorrow shall turn into joy. So they're, so they're all sorrowful. There's concern that Jesus has told them that He's leaving. It's dark outside. They're in a garden. And now they've come to a place, verse number 1 of John chapter 18. The Bible says, when Jesus had spoken these words, He went forth with His disciples over the brook Kidron, 
where was a garden, that's the Garden of Gethsemane, into the which he entered and his disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said unto them, I am he. Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. And as soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Then asked he them again, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spake, of them which thou gavest me have I lost none. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Let me ask you this morning, as we go through this passage and as we see this time of Jesus being in the garden and, and what John doesn't mention, mention and some of what we're going to talk about this morning comes from some other passages. John mentions some things that happen just before this crowd and this group come. John goes straight to, they're in the garden and here comes Judas and here comes the soldiers and here comes the, the high priest servants and here comes all this group of people that are coming out to seek Jesus. You know what's interesting about John? John, again and again and again throughout the book of John, what is it that he's been trying to talk about? What is it he's trying to prove? He proves that Jesus is God, and he wants us to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. That is the purpose of the book of John. He mentions it towards the end, and he talks about, I want you to know, the Holy Spirit talking through John, right, says, I want you to know and believe that Jesus is God. And I want you to believe that he came and died on a cross for you and was buried and rose again because he has the power to do that because he's God. He had the power to conquer sin in the grave. He had the power to do all those things. Therefore, you... If you will trust in Him, you can have life. You can't do it on your own. You'll never make it by yourself. But if you will trust the Lord Jesus Christ, if you will believe that He is the Son of God, you can have life through His name. You can have life through Him. You can't get life any other way. By the way, this morning, if you're trying anything else, you can't get life any other way. You can't have eternal life through the good things that you do. You can't have eternal life through uh, the number of times that you go to church or by how many times you get in water. You can't get saved and you can't have eternal life anyway except through the Lord Jesus. And John's been saying that again and again and again. He's going to point once again to Christ's deity here in this passage. And I want you to notice a couple of things very quickly as we look at this passage. John is the only one who mentions in verse number 4 here that when the crowd came, Jesus went forth to them and said, Whom seek ye? In other passages, we find out that Judas says, the one that I go and kiss his cheek, that's the one that you want. And that's how Judas betrayed him. And Jesus talks to him, and we see some other conversations and things took place. But we see here in this passage that Jesus approaches them. I want you to see here that he is prepared for the moment. He's prepared for the moment. See, how is it that Jesus was prepared for this moment? Here he is ready to go. We don't see Jesus. Some people sometimes paint him as various different things, but we don't see Jesus running off and hiding. He knows that the Father has something for him to do. He knows what the Father's will is. And we see him prepared in so much that he steps out, and here is this throng of people coming to take him away. And he asks them, Whom seekest thou? Who are you looking for? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. Now watch this. In your Bible, the word he is italicized. It's put there as an understanding in our English language to help us understand what Christ is saying. He's saying, I, Christ literally says, I am. They say, who are you seeking? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I am. I, I am he. But there's more to that. There is a powerful statement here that Christ gives. I am. Do you, do you remember that when they asked him, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all of them asking back in John chapter 8, they said, 
How can you claim to have seen and to know Abraham and, and, and all of that? How can you do How can you say that? And he says, before Abraham was, I am. Who is I am? It's God Almighty. It is Jehovah God. He is the Lord. He is God Almighty. And that's what the Lord is saying. I am. In so much that the, there is so much power in that statement that the Bible says what? They fall back onto the ground. When Jesus makes that statement and he says, I am, they fall down on the ground. And they are so foolish and arrogant that they get right back up and continue on with their job. I don't know about you, but if, I, if you were to walk in this morning and I were to come up to you and I were to say, or you ask me, who are you looking for? And I go, I'm looking for you, mister. And you say, my name is John. And I go, bam, and fall down on the floor because of you saying that. I think I'd think twice before getting back up and trying to take you away to prison. I don't know, that's just me. But they don't. The Bible says they get back and he asks again, whom do you seek? And they say again, Jesus of Nazareth. But I want you to see the power there the power that he had in this moment, in this situation, how prepared he was in the moment, the power that he had, and then the peace that he had at such a moment. Don't forget, the Bible says that knowing all things in verse number 4. He knows what is about to take place. He knows where they're taking him. He knows about what he's about to face and what he's getting ready to go through. And yet there is a peace. Peter jumps out, draws the sword, swings at the guy's head, the guy probably ducks and he gets just the right ear. And Jesus says, Peter, there's more than one time in Jesus' life that he had to do this. <laughs> Peter, what are you doing, man? Come on. He says, put, put, put your sword away. Put your sword back. Shall I not drink the cup that my Father has for me? There is a preparation that Christ had when, when he faces this mob. There is a power that he had. There's a peace that he had in the midst of the greatest difficulty, the greatest human conflict, and the greatest human pain that he was going to face while on this earth. That's, he's about to go through that, and yet in the midst of that, he was prepared for it. There was power and there was peace in the midst of all that. How did Christ have that, and how was he able to go? Now, I understand that he's God, yes. And that's always the right answer. Yes, Jesus is God. Humanly speaking, how was Christ able to, in this same way, be prepared for all this? Because there's something very important that took place. John doesn't mention it because his focus is on Jesus as God. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all make mention of what took place just before this happened. You've read your Bible. You could probably think back and know exactly what we're going to and what we're going to look at this morning and talk about. And it's this, and it's one word, prayer. Prayer. Jesus had prayed in the garden, and when the time came for them to come and to take him away, he was prepared to go. He had a power that he had because of who he was, and he had a peace about going forward to the cross because of the time spent in prayer with the Father. I believe that. And I believe this morning that prayer is the work that still gives the believer today the ability to press on in the most difficult of times. When Christ, humanly speaking, was faced with the cross and the death of the cross, He continued to move forward and to go. The Bible talks about how He endured the cross, despising the shame. Why? I believe in great part because of the time spent in prayer with his father before the cross. We're going to look at some of that this morning and see what it is that prayer does in our life and how the Lord used prayer of his time on the earth. And if Jesus, who was God in the flesh, yet human at the same time, 100% man, 100% God, if he used prayer to his I'll use the word advantage, so to speak, and to his good while he was here on the earth. How much should you and I, his followers, use prayer in our lives while we are here? Let's have a word of prayer right now and then jump 
headlong into this message and these passages this morning and look and see what the Bible talks concerning matters of prayer. Father, thank you for the opportunity this morning to come to you in prayer. Thank you for the ability to come together and the freedoms that we have here in America to celebrate uh, and to preach the gospel, to preach the word. And I thank you for that ability to come this morning. And I pray that you would use this time together in your word. I pray the Holy Spirit of God would work and move. Lord, this message this morning is, is to, to help to be a comfort to those who are believers, to, to be able to use power in our life and to use the power of prayer in our lives. But Lord, there's one here this morning that doesn't know you, Lord, they have no idea what it is to be able to live a life of preparation. They have no idea what it is to be able to live a life of power. They have no idea what it is to be able to live a life of peace because they have none of that apart from you. And Lord, if there's one here this morning, oh, how I pray that you would speak to their heart. I pray the Holy Spirit of God would convict them of their sin and of their need of a Savior. Lord, I pray that you would move and that you would work I pray that you would show us this morning the importance of prayer in our life. Lord, may we not just hear a message, but may we leave this morning and be doers of the Word of God as well. Lord, I thank you for your Word. I thank you for your example. I pray that we would follow it this morning, and it's in Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. I mean, look here with me and, and back to the beginning of John chapter number 18. Three thoughts on, on prayer here, and then we'll talk some of what prayer does and what doesn't occur when we pray and when we don't pray. I think we see here from this passage that prayer should be something that is done often. Prayer should be often. The Bible says in verse number 2, Judas also which betrayed him knew the place, for Jesus oft times resorted thither, with his disciples. You know, Jesus' method, so to speak, as he went about, was to bathe everything in prayer. Judas knew where to go here in the Garden of Gethsemane because the Bible says that Jesus had gone there off. In other words, he did it all the time. In other words, during his ministry on earth, there was many a day and many an hour which was spent in the Garden of Gethsemane. It wasn't just before he went to the cross. It wasn't just the night before that all of a sudden Jesus was like, maybe I should go here and have a time of prayer. The Bible says that Jesus oft times went to this place. Judas knew where to go because it was a habit of Jesus to get away and to go and to spend time in prayer. In Luke 18 and verse number 1, the Bible says that Jesus spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. That's what we ought to always be doing. We ought to always be praying. We ought to always be in an attitude and in a spirit of prayer. When George Mueller was asked how much time he spent in prayer, he said, hours every day. He said, I live in the spirit of prayer. He said, when I get up, I pray. When I walk about, I pray. When I lay down, I pray, and the answers are always coming. Well, that's the life of prayer that we ought to live, a life that is, is never ceasing to pray. That's what the Bible tells us again and again throughout the Word of God. Continue in prayer. Continue in prayer. Be in prayer. Pray without ceasing, the Bible says. We ought to always be in an attitude of prayer. Just to see Christ's example of prayer and His life, Mark 1.35, the Bible says, In the morning... Rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. Luke 6, 12, it says, And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. Matthew 14, 22 and 23 says, Straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him into the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. Again and again and again in the life of Christ, we see him getting up early in the morning to pray, staying up all night in order to pray, getting up and going apart and getting by himself into a mountain apart so that he can pray and get alone and talk to his father. I'm here to tell you this morning, if it was important in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, who was God in the flesh, it was, if it was important for him to often spend time in prayer, how much more important is it in my life and your life? How important is it for you to spend time in prayer? How important is it for you to go to the Lord in prayer? How important is it for you to seek the Father's will in prayer? Boy, we spend a lot of time in many other things. How much time do you spend in prayer? Boy, it ought to be something that's done often. 
We talk about things that happen often in our lives. How many times a day do we check our phones? How many times a day do we get on Facebook? How many times a day do we play games? How many times a day do we turn on the TV? How many times? The, I'm talking about things that just in general happen often in the lives of people. You say, well, I pray often because I eat often. So there we go. I, I do pray often. I bless the food every time, every snack and every meal, and I am praying all day. Amen to that and amen to that. But maybe we should pray a little bit more than just that. Maybe our life should be... Uh, more than just, I prayed morning, noon, and night because I ate morning, noon, and night. I, I prayed and I spent time in prayer because of the need that I had to go to the Lord in prayer. It was something that was done often in Jesus' life. If it was done often in His life, it ought to be done often in your life as well. Prayer should be often. Prayer should be open. But when the Lord went into the garden and when he prayed with the Father, it look at the prayer. I want to read it with you. And, and, and I want you to write down some of these verses. And, and if you have a chance, go to them. But I'm going to be going to many different verses. So I may not have time to, uh, to, to go to every one. But Mark chapter 14 and verse 36. I want you to see this first. So if you look at Mark chapter 14 and verse number 36, Jesus, when he goes into the garden and he goes to pray, the Bible says that he has his disciples there. He sets them down and he says to the, a group of them, he says, stay here, I'm going to go and pray. He takes Peter and James and John and takes them a little bit farther along with him. Then he tells them, you watch here and you pray. And then he goes on and the Bible says that he goes about far as a stone's cast. So as far as you can throw a rock, that's about the distance that Jesus and, and, and Peter and James and John were. And Jesus falls down on his knees and he cries out in Mark 14, 36. Look what he says. He said, Abba, Father. Uh, that word Abba, if we were to use an English equivalent, it's like a child coming up to the Father and saying, Daddy, Daddy, uh, Daddy. Your, your children ever do that to you? Daddy. Uh, and you're like, what do you want? <laughs> Immediately, okay, what do you want? When Jesus approached the Father, He approached with a, the same way that He told you and I to approach Him, with a child like Father, Abba, Father. There's a closeness there. There's a relationship there. And there's only a few people on this earth that, that, that call me daddy, but it's because of the relationship that we have. It's because of the relationship that we're able to have with one another. And the same thing is true and is true with the father and his children and with Christ and with the father that he says, Abba, Father. Notice what he says, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. Now, there's a lot of arguments over these verses. I say arguments, but discussion over what these verses mean and what the possible scenario is here. We know that Jesus knew from the foundation of the world. The Bible speaks of Jesus Christ being the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. We know that, that Jesus had to be the sacrifice for sin. We know that he was the spotless lamb of God who had to die in our place. But I think from a human standpoint, Jesus sees everything that he's about to go through. He sees and knows the pain and the agony physically that he's going to go through. But then also in the aspect of the Bible says that, that God made him, Jesus, to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Jesus Christ was going to have to take on all the sins of the world, past, present, and future, there on the cross. And He knew what was about to come. And humanly speaking, there was a, Father, if there's any other way, if there's anything else, but then immediately there was, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. He knew what had to be done, but humanly speaking, there's, we see, I think, His humanity and His deity coming together there and Him saying, Father, if it be possible, but then saying, but I know it's not. I know what I have to do. I know what you've called me to do. I know what your will is. And we're going to see that here in just a moment. But it is an open prayer. It is an open prayer. Lord, Lord Father, I'm coming to you. I'm just letting you know what's going on right now. You know, we should never be afraid for our prayers to be open before the Lord. God, I'm struggling with this right now. God, I'm having a hard time with this right now. God, I need you right now. This, I, I, I'm struggling in this way. I'm struggling in this area. Lord, I, I'm calling on you and asking you for your help. Lord, I want you to know you know, there is nothing wrong as a, as a child going to the Father and being open in our prayers. 
uh, Spurgeon talked about this and talked about this scenario and he said our prayers ought to be like going to a bank. He said when we go to a bank, he said we have a, what, what he called a note, but he says we have a check is basically what he's saying. And when we go there, we're going there for one purpose. We're going there to cash the check, okay, and to get and receive our money from the bank. He says, our prayers ought to be the same way. He says, you can go and you can beat around the bush and you can talk about a whole lot of other things uh, if you want to. He said, but at the end of the day, you're there for what? Because you want to get the check cash. Our prayers ought to be the same way. We don't have to beat around the bush with God. Why? Because he already knows. He already knows what things we have need of before we ask. We can be open with our prayers to the Lord, and we should be, and we ought to talk to Him. There's nothing that we should not take to Him in prayer. There's nothing that you can't talk to the Father about. There's nothing in your life that's happening, that's going on, that you can't take before Him and say, Lord, here it is. Father, here it is. The Bible tells us that Jesus went and He prayed to the Father. But prayer should be often, prayer should be open, prayer should be ongoing. The Bible tells us, if you look in these other passages, Matthew, Mark, Luke, that Jesus goes and he prays, and he prays this prayer. Father, if it be possible. He comes back. What, what are Peter, James, and John? What are the disciples? What are they doing? It's late at night. They're sleeping. It's late at night. Maybe it's even after midnight and in the wee hours of the morning at this point in time. And they go and, and, and they're sleeping. They're tired. Their eyes are heavy, the Bible says. And they're sleeping. And Jesus comes back and he says, Couldn't you watch with me one hour, Peter? Peter, just a few minutes before you were all bragging about, I'll, I'll go to jail with you. Lord, I'll even die for you. There's no way I'm ever going to deny you. But you can't pray with me for one hour? Come on. Come on, Peter. He says, Pray, lest you enter into temptation. And he goes back, and the Bible says he goes back and he prays again. He comes back, and they're asleep the second time. He goes back, and he prays the third time. Prayer should be ongoing. It should be something that is continuously happening. It should be something that we are going back again and again and again. It's not enough to just one time. Well, I prayed one time, and the Lord didn't answer that prayer, so I'm done praying for that. Well, I prayed for that person one time, but uh, that's it. I prayed about this difficult situation one time, and, and God didn't do anything, so I'm done with that. No, no, prayer should be ongoing. It should be something that we do again and again and again. And that's what the Lord told His disciples. Watch and pray. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, He said, but the flesh is weak. You need to be continuously Praying. You ought to always be praying. Jesus says that to his disciples. You know, the truth is, in our lives, when we often get caught up in everything else that's going on, and we're not continuous in going back to the Lord in prayer. We've got other things to do. We've got other things that are interrupting and taking the place of that. We have things that we've got to get back to. We were, we were uh, just this last week. We were sitting down to have a meal with the kids, and uh, I, I began to pray for the food together. And I won't throw any of my children under the bus, so I won't tell you which one of my oldest sons that it was. So, <laughs> and I'm holding his hand here, and we're praying. And right in the middle of my prayer, I hear. <laughs> And I stopped. He's just over there having a chip, right in the middle, right in the middle of the, right in the middle of prayer. What? Can you wait till we finish praying? But I'm hungry now. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Twelve more seconds, though, man. Twelve more seconds, and we could have made it. Aren't we guilty of the same thing oftentimes in our life? We can't wait till the end to hurry up and get on with whatever we're doing. We can't wait to hurry up and finish so we can get on with what it is that we want and we desire. We can't wait to hurry up. And it's like even in the middle of praying, listen, we're probably all guilty of it, but even in the middle of praying sometimes, there are 17 different things that happen in the middle of praying. There, this comes to mind and this comes to mind and this comes to mind. Have you ever been praying and then all of a sudden in the midst of your praying, you find yourself somewhere out in left field and you, you get and you're like, wait a minute, how did I get here? How did I get over here? Because we are so distracted by the things of the world. The Spirit is willing, 
but the flesh is weak. And Christ reminds His disciples that our prayer should be something that is ongoing. It's something that should always be taking place in our life. And so prayer, prayer is something that should be done often. It's something that should be open to the Father and it should be ongoing. Let me run through very quickly with you. Praying leads to, and i got three thoughts for you there, and then three thoughts very quickly on what praying does not lead to. And I am going to give it to you quickly, okay? First of all, if we look in Christ's life in this scenario right here, we saw that when He was able to go, He was able to face, He was able to be prepared, He had power, and there was a peace about Him. But in the midst of His praying, His praying led to assistance in doing God's will. Assistance in doing God's will. Luke, it's amazing how things are just sometimes uh, just kind of thrown there into a Bible passage and you can read it and you maybe read it a, a lots of times, but then you read it again and you're like, oh, wow, that's right. That, I, I forgot that that had happened. I forgot. Look, Luke chapter 22 and verses 42 and 43, Christ is praying in the garden and he prays and saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. And then immediately he says again, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Then Luke's the only one who mentions this. He says this in the next verse, And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. Isn't that amazing that God Almighty in flesh on the earth, that the Father says, you need some strength and some help right now. It's amazing to me that God in the flesh, that the Father says, I'm going to send an angel down there and strengthen and help and encourage you. What's he doing? He's giving him assistance and giving him help and strength to face what he's about to go through. Prayer will do that for you, by the way. Praying to the Father and asking for help will give you the help that you need. See, sometimes I don't even know how to pray for. I don't even know what to pray for. I'm in the midst of this debacle. I'm in the midst of this horrible situation. I'm in the midst of this frustrating time, this difficult time, and I don't know what to do. You know one of the things that you can do is just pray, and sometimes don't even use words. Just pray. <laughs> Say, what are you talking about? Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and verse 27 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we all, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. I'm glad that even when I don't know what to pray for like I ought to, the Spirit knows how to pray for me like I ought to. The Father knows what I need. He, has need, he, he knows what we have need of before we ask it, but we come to Him and we pray, and there are times in our life where prayer is just, it starts with God, and then there's just some silence. <laughs> and then there's just, okay, Lord, I don't really know. But in the, midst of that, in the midst of that, just like we talked about last week, Jesus is praying for you. The Spirit of God is praying for you. He's making intercession for you. One preacher said it's better that our words, uh, it, it's better that, our, our, that we would pray without words and pray with our heart than that we would pray without our heart and only with our words. Sometimes it's just stopping and just going to the Lord in prayer. He's going to help you. He's going to give you assistance. When Jesus prayed, God said, I'm going to send an angel to come down and to help you and to strengthen you for this time that is about to come ahead of you. Second thing that praying leads to, it leads to agony through God's will. Agony through God's will. You say, wait a minute, I already have enough agony. I already have enough problems. Why, why do I want to pray for more? Notice with me what the Bible says there in the next verse in Luke chapter 22. It says, and being in an agony, this is right after the Bible says that an angel comes and strengthens him. Then it says, and being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Agony is not necessarily a bad thing. We often speak about the agony of defeat. We hear it used of that. Oh, the agony of defeat. Oh, the agony of defeat. You are almost there, but oh, the agony of defeat. You ever hear anybody talk about the agony of victory? We don't hear it used that way, but yet... That's the word that's used here in the Greek language. The word that is used for agony is the same word that is used to express and to talk about those who are training and who are preparing and who are fighting their way through in the Olympic Games. The, the, the same word that's used here for Christ was says that He was in an agony. So what did He do? He prayed more earnestly. The agony didn't make Him quit 
The agony made him say, I, I'm going to pray more earnestly. I'm praying. He's praying, and the Bible says, as it were, great sweat drops of blood that are coming and that are flowing off and dripping off of his forehead. He goes even deeper and even more into that time of prayer. There's an agony there, yes. There's an anguish there, yes. But the word agony has an idea there of a struggle for victory. He's in the garden, and maybe you've heard this expression used, he's praying through. He's praying through. He sees the agony that lies ahead. He knows what's coming, and he's in a deep agony because of all that. But he prays even more earnestly, the Bible says. Oh, that you and I, in the difficult times, we would not give up because of a little bit of agony, but that we would allow the agony of going through that to fulfill itself in victory through prayer. Yes, there's an agony. Yes, there's hurt. Doesn't mean you stop. I'm going through a difficult time. You don't understand what I'm facing. I know, according to the Word of God, what Christ was facing. I know, according to the Word of God, what He was going through. And the Bible said He was in a great agony, but it led Him to pray more earnestly. It led Him to go even deeper in prayer, not to step away from it and say, it's no use, it's no good. No, no, no. He prays even harder and he goes even more in prayer. Someone wrote this and they said, the struggle at the cross was first won in prayer in Gethsemane. Christ went through and followed through in the cross, and he, but he had a great victory as he agonized through God's will and through the prayer in Gethsemane. And then prayer leads not only to assistance in God's will and agony through God's will, but then acceptance of God's will. The, when Jesus Christ was on the earth, he said again and again and again, not my will, but thine be done. Not my will, but thine be done. Now here, humanly speaking, there was a lot that he was about to face, and yet Jesus Christ prayed again and again in the garden, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. He says, Lord, if the only way, Father, he says, if this cup pass not from me except I drink it, thy will be done. If the only way, if the only way for people to be saved, if the only way for me to come back and to be in your presence, if the only way is for me to go through and to drink of the cup that you have for me, then thy will be done. It was an acceptance of the Father's will. Now, he and God were always on the same page. He knew that, but yeah, I believe we see this prayer in the garden for an example for us of saying, you know, Lord, I, I mean, physically speaking, it's not like he desired to go through the pain. It's not like he desired to, to do all that. But yet the Bible says, for the joy that was set before him. How was there joy in going to the cross? Because he knew what the end result would bring. Because he knew what the death on the cross provided. And it provided life for me and for you. And there was an acceptance as he prayed to the Father, not my will, but thine be done. Aren't you thankful that Christ finished in prayer? Aren't you thankful that He went through in the garden and that He took time to pray and that He took time to, to talk to the Father and that He took time to go to that cross and to die and to be buried? Without Christ going to the cross, there's no hope for you and me. Without Christ dying and shedding His blood, there's no hope for you and me. Without Him being buried and rising again, conquering sin in the grave, there's no hope for you and for me. But He prayed through in the garden and a victory was won, and victory was had. And God the Father said, I'm going to give you some assistance. I'm going to help you through the agony and help your way through to victory. And you're going to, together, we accept what has to be done. And you move forward in the will of the Father. Now, in contrast, back to our passage, and I'll close very quickly with this thought. I want you to look at Peter real quickly. Where's Peter while Jesus is praying? He's sleeping on a rock. I don't know if it was a rock or not, okay? But he's sleeping over there. He's finding somewhere to lay his head down in the garden. He's found somewhere to sit down and to fall asleep. And Jesus has to come and wake him up and says, well, Could you not watch with me? Could you, could you not pray with me for just one hour? Peter, who said, I'll die for you. I'll never deny you. I'll even go to jail for you. And Jesus says, No, you're going to deny me three times. Peter says, No, I'll never do that. But yet he couldn't pray. So what happens when we do not pray? Jesus said to his disciples, he says, He cometh to them, he finds them asleep. He says unto Peter, What, could you not watch with me one hour? I'm in Matthew 26, verses 40 and 41. 
He tells them then, watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now, in our passage that we read a few moments ago at the beginning in John chapter number 18, the Bible says that they come, that they, they ask him, whom Jesus says, whom seek is thou? He says, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus says, I am he. They fall down on the ground. They get up again. Who do you seek? Jesus of Nazareth. I am he. And then Jesus tells them, let these go away. Let my disciples go away. If you're seeking me, let them go. All right? And, and, and we don't see this in John, but in Luke. This is an interesting passage. Luke chapter 22, verse number 49. It says, When they which were about him saw what would follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? All right, so here's the disciples. Jesus has been talking to them about everything that's going to take place, about what's going to happen. They still don't quite understand Jesus being taken away and Jesus going to the cross. They still don't quite get all that. But here's this, here's this throng of people that are coming, soldiers, I mean Roman soldiers and servants of the high priest and Judas leading them and all this, and they're coming with lanterns and lights and all of this, and they're coming out to Jesus. And some of the disciples that are with Jesus, okay, they're down to 11 now because Judas is gone. So there's Jesus and the 11. And here are some of them. They ask a question when they see what's about to follow. In other words, they, they see what's about to happen. These people are coming to take Jesus. And they say to him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? Lord, is this where we take our final stand? Lord, do we die for you? Lord, do we fight? Is that what you want us to do right now? Peter apparently does not wait for an answer. And there goes Malchus right here. You know what not praying leads to? First of all, it leads to hasty decisions. Well, you're in the middle of something. Oh no, something's getting ready to happen. Jesus, remember Jesus. He's prepared. There is power and there's peace. In the midst of all these people coming to take him away to kill him. And yet, he's fine. What's Peter doing? Pulling out the sword. Somebody asked, Jesus, is this where we fight? Is this where we take our stand? Should we go after him? And Peter doesn't wait for an answer because Jesus would have said, no, I've been trying to tell you. This is what's supposed to happen. Peter doesn't wait. Pulls out the sword and starts hacking. And there goes an the ear. And Malchus is sitting here. What in the world just happened? Hasty decisions. How often do we make decisions in life? When we haven't prayed? How often are we in the midst of something that's a difficult trial, a difficult situation, and we go, okay, and proverbially we just pull out the sword and start hacking? Why? Because we didn't pray. We're not prepared for the situation. We're not prepared to make a decision because we haven't prayed about it. We're not prepared to face what's ahead because we haven't prayed about it. We've not been spending the time in prayer like we ought to, so we just pull out the sword and start hacking until something happens. And there goes a the right ear. Hasty decisions. Oh, can I encourage you, brethren, sistren? I know that's not a word, but okay. Can I encourage you, before you make that next decision, whether it seems like an easy one or whether it's the hardest one you've ever had to do in your life, Spend some time in prayer. Stop and pray. Agonize through prayer when need be, but come out on the other side knowing what it is that the Lord desires for you to do. Spend the time in prayer. Not praying leads to hasty decisions. Not praying leads to hateful decisions. He cut off his ear. Okay? I don't think he was aiming for his ear. I think he was aiming for his head. I think either he ducked or either Peter had really bad aim, one or the other. But it wasn't like that was like the everyday life of Peter. No, he's a fisherman. He wasn't a trained soldier. But in the moment, I'm just going to protect Jesus. And it was that. I mean, he just starts swinging his sword and lopping at people's heads. In contrast to that, it's amazing what Luke says that Jesus does. Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far? And he touched his ear and healed him. Here's Peter hacking around with the sword, making a hateful decision. And here's Jesus picking up the ear of the guy who's taking him away, the high priest servant 
who's taken him away to be crucified, and he takes his ear and puts it back on his head and touches it and heals him. Can you imagine what it must have been like to be that guy? Can you imagine what it was like to be Malchus? One moment you're going, ah, I lost my... Oh my goodness, what did you just do? <laughs> and here he is. Peter, though, hasty decision, hateful decision. You'll make some hateful decisions if you don't bathe your life in prayer. Boy, think about the things that are going on in your life right now. Think about the problem you maybe have. Maybe it's something going on with a family member. Maybe it's something going on with a friend. Maybe it's something going on at work. Maybe it's something going on in your country. Maybe it's something going on just in your life with some other person, some other people, and it's a difficult task that you're facing ahead. Let me tell you, if you don't bathe it in prayer, you'll find yourself going to the flesh and making some pretty hateful decisions towards other people. Don't make hasty decisions. Don't make hateful decisions because this is the outcome of them. They end up being hurtful decisions. This is what I mean by that. You're in John chapter 18 or you have been at some point in time this morning. I want you to look over to verse number 26. At this point in time, Jesus has been taken away. They're trying to go and see. Some of his disciples are trying to see what's going on and what's happening. And in verse number 26, look at this. Let's get back to verse number 25. Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. He's warmed himself outside the fire. They said, therefore, unto him, Art not thou also one of his disciples? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, being his kinsman, whose ear Peter cut off, saith, Did not I see thee in the garden with him? Here's a kinsman to Malchus. And he sees Peter and he goes, Hey, I think I saw you there. Hey. You cut off my cousin's ear. Hey, you cut off my brother's ear. Whoever it was, the Bible just says he was a kinsman to him. Maybe he was a brother, maybe he was a cousin, maybe he was, whatever, but he was, another, he was another servant to the high priest. And he points at Peter and he goes, I remember you. You're the guy who chopped that guy's ear off. Hurtful decisions. Not only was Peter affected by it, but other people were affected by it too. But Peter was remembered by this guy a few hours later, albeit, but he was remembered by this guy for being the one in the garden with Jesus who chopped his brother's ear off or his cousin's ear off or whatever it was. I remember, oh yeah, I remember seeing you. you know, there are some decisions in life that you'll make when you don't pray. They'll be hurtful decisions and they'll be hard to live down if you're making those decisions without prayer. Listen, when you pray, God works. When you and I pray, the Lord says, okay, here's what I'm going to do in your life. I am going to help you. I'm going to assist you. I'm going to help you with the hard times and the difficulty. And I'm going to help you with knowing that this is God's will for your life and moving forward and what you ought to do. Now, you may not know what tomorrow holds like Christ did. We certainly can't look into the future. But you can certainly still be prepared and have God's power and have His peace to go through any difficulty if you will always be in prayer. Let me ask you this morning, simple question. Are you a person of prayer? Are you a person of prayer? You know whether you are or not. You know whether you spend time in prayer or not. You know whether you spend time in a lot of other things other than prayer. Are you a person of prayer this morning? With every head bowed and every eye closed this morning, we're going to